Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are coming to the end of our studies in the Gospel of John. We're at the end of chapter 20. I think we have two more lessons in this magnificent book. But we're looking this morning at a rather lengthy passage, verses 19 through 31, to conclude chapter 20. We ended last week with Mary coming and announcing to the disciples that uh, uh, she had seen the Lord. So she's announced the resurrection to these disciples. And now we read in verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week. Now, uh, let me pause for a moment. Uh, Do you know why the church meets on Sunday? Well, this is the reason, because of the resurrection. The Jewish people, the nation of Israel, meet on Saturday, on the last day of the week, on Sabbath, because that is the sign of the Old Covenant. Uh, Exodus chapter 31, verses 16 and 17 make that clear, that it is, Sabbath is the sign, the symbol to Israel of the covenant of Moses that God made with Israel. We're not under the old covenant any longer. We're under the new covenant. And so the church began meeting on Sunday. Now, you go to the book of Acts, the second chapter after the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 are saved that day, and then others are being saved. Many, many people are coming to faith there in Jerusalem. And you read that the church met every day in the temple, and then they were meeting from house to house and breaking bread, celebrating the Lord's Supper. That's in the very first days of the church, which began on the day of Pentecost. But you go later into the book of Acts, in chapter 20 and verse 7, Paul visits the church at Troas in Asia Minor, and they met on the first day of the week. So they had gone from every day to one day, and that one day was the first day of the week. And then Paul also mentions that in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, about taking a collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem, and when they meet on the first day of the week, they're to take up this collection. So after a few years, they began meeting on this one day, and the day they chose was the first day of the week. It's the day of the resurrection. So every Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection, and really every day, we live in the light of and in the power, as Christians, of the resurrection. But we read here, on the first day of the week, and when the doors, he, he came, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples went, saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving but believing. 
Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and may he bless each of us as we study this great chapter and this great passage in the Gospel of John, and build us up in the faith, and give glory to him. Let's pray. Father. In the United Nations Garden in New York City is a, a large bronze statue of a muscular man with a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. It is called, Let Us Beat Swords into Plowshares, a symbolic expression of the words that are found in Isaiah chapter 2. The donor was the Soviet Union. There is obvious irony in that. Even if the intentions were good, neither the giver nor the receiver nor the, the statue did much for the dream of peace. But then mankind is helpless in bringing peace to a troubled world and helpless to bringing peace to a restless soul. That's what makes the first words our Lord spoke to his disciples after the resurrection so significant. Peace be with you. Three times in John chapter 20, the Lord greets his disciples with these words. What, a, what the wise and the powerful of this world are not able to do, Christ did. And he came out of the grave to announce peace to his disciples. They were in hiding. Ten of the disciples and some others were behind locked doors somewhere in Jerusalem in fear for their lives and, and no doubt uh, about their futures. They were in despair. They knew the tomb was empty, but they didn't know what had happened to the body. They heard reports that Christ had appeared to some women Mary Magdalene had come to them. She had spoken about that, but they were not believing them. They were a group of scared men huddled in hiding when Jesus came and stood in their midst and greeted them with those words, Peace be with you. He passed through the locked doors just as his resurrection body passed through the grave clothes with ease. He simply materialized in the room. His greeting of peace be with you is the conventional Hebrew greeting, Shalom Aleichem, that you hear today on the streets of Jerusalem. Traditional greetings, though, can lose their meaning after a while, but this greeting was full of meaning and was a beautiful choice of words for a frightened group of men. The Lord might have greeted them otherwise. He might have greeted them with shame on you. They'd all deserted him and they'd fled the scene of his arrest. Peter had even denied him three times. But he didn't do that. He didn't come condemning or accusing. He came in grace. He came speaking of forgiveness and reconciliation. He came declaring peace. The last statement he made to them in the upper room in John chapter 16 is, I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. His first words to them on his return are, peace be with you. What a great word peace is. It means the war is over. Hostility is at an end. That's the message the Lord brought to His disciples. It is the good news of the gospel. Ever since Adam's sin, 
Man has been at war with God and at war with himself. Man, by nature, apart from grace, apart from the sovereign love and grace of God, man is a rebel. Paul describes us as hostile toward God in Romans chapter 8, verse 7. He doesn't mean by that that, that people can't be civilized and well-mannered, that they, they can't show kindness to others, love their children, be good neighbors, law-abiding citizens. Man to man, person to person, many people measure up well according to our standards of human decency. They're patriots, philanthropists, models to the community. But when measured by God's standard, which is perfection, we all fall short and we all stand condemned. His truth exposes our failures before His absolute pure righteousness. And men hate that. But that is reality, as the Bible reveals it. But there is a, a further reality, and that is that the war has ended. That's the good news. God's wrath has been turned away from all who believe in Christ because Christ died for them. He suffered for their sins, He paid for them all, and established peace between God and man, between God and the believer. That's Paul's declaration in Romans chapter 1 verse, uh, rather Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through His death for us. And every person for whom that is true not only has peace with God, but also has the peace of God. Our Creator is now our Father. Our Judge is now our Father, who cares for us as a father should care for his children. All of his mighty power is directed to help and bless us. After all, if He gave His Son for us, He will not withhold anything from us that is good for us. God is for us. What does it matter who is against us? Well, that's the reason for peace. Peace with God and the peace of God. Well, that's what Christ came declaring to His frightened and ashamed disciples. Peace. He even signaled peace in the manner in which he approached them. He didn't come in a display of power. He didn't blow the door off its hinges. He didn't enter with thunder and lightning. He came quietly. Like the Lord came to Elijah at Mount Horeb. Not in the great wind that broke rocks or the earthquake and fire that shook the mountain. He spoke to the discouraged prophet in a, a, a gentle breeze. The Lord is gentle with His people, with, with His disciples. He is gentle. He speaks peace. Then we read that He showed them His hands and side to prove that the one speaking to them was actually Him, now risen from the dead. Luke's account states that they were frightened by His appearance, thinking He was a spirit. But when He showed them His wounds, they knew they were seeing a real body. Then, John said, the disciples rejoiced. The reports were true. Christ was alive from the dead, and they were having fellowship with Him, with the living Christ. Now that tells us something about the experience of peace and joy. It is the result of having fellowship with Him. He is more than a memory. He's a living person, and we can enjoy His presence every day. That's what we should seek. The disciples did that, and they rejoiced. 
We have a living Savior, not a dead martyr. And because He is alive, we have peace in life. We have joy in life. We have meaning in life. Our lives have purpose. We have a great work to do in this world. And in verse 21, the Lord gave the disciples their mission. He said, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. But he prefaced their commission with the words, peace be with you. Why did he repeat his, his assurance of peace? I think it was to encourage them to accept this mission that he gave to them. It would not be easy. When he concluded the Upper Room Discourse at the end of chapter 16, he said, In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Now as he sent them out into a hostile world where they would face tribulation, he comforted them with the assurance of peace. It was the assurance that all would be well for them. Through the trials and tribulations, all would be well. And it was not an empty promise because the one who spoke these words is the one who conquered death. He is alive and he is ruling. The one standing before them was not a phantom or a, a, a figment of their collective imaginations. He was real. He presented them tangible evidence. The wounds of his hands inside. Christ is risen. And that means he is alive for us in every situation of life. And there to give guidance, there to give protection and help. But that's not all. He has equipped us with the Holy Spirit. He gave him to the disciples in verse 22. After speaking, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. This was a pre-Pentecost provision of the Holy Spirit for blessing and help in the days leading up to that event when the Spirit was given permanently to the church. But it is a proof of the, of the power that accompanies us to enable us to live well to have peace, to live the life of Christ and to, and to do the work of God. We have the power of heaven within us. And the, the work of the apostles and church, our work is given in verse 23. It's the work of forgiveness. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now this is not some special power given to priests or ministers to absolve sin or withhold forgiveness. There is no example of an apostle doing that in the New Testament. But there are many examples of them proclaiming the gospel of forgiveness and warning of the consequences of unbelief. That's what is meant here. Christians have the authority to proclaim the gospel and assure those who believe in Jesus Christ that their sins are forgiven. And those who don't believe, that their sins are retained. Men don't have the power to create forgiveness of sins and reconcile us to God. That is the Lord's work alone. And that is indicated in the grammar of the statement. The, the verbs are passive. It's not they have achieved their forgiveness or they have obtained their forgiveness, but their sins have been forgiven. It's happened to them, which implies divine agency in it. But also, the verbs are in what is known in Greek as the perfect tense, which is a past tense, but implies a state of, uh, uh, or condition that preceded the proclamation. In other words, forgiveness had already been determined in heaven and is now merely proclaimed on the earth. 
forgiveness of sin has already been obtained for all who believe, whoever they may be, however great their sins may be, because Christ secured forgiveness on the cross. That's where it was achieved. That's where it was obtained. That's the message of our mission. Peace, forgiveness of sin, reconciliation with God, and eternal life for all who believe in Christ. It was a great moment for the disciples. Christ had, had come to them. He had revealed himself as alive from the dead, given them a, a mission, and equipped them for that mission with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. But something was missing. A person was absent. Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. He had not recovered from the shock of Christ's arrest and crucifixion. When Christ died on the cross, Thomas's faith seemed to die. He had withdrawn from the group. When the others found him and told him about the Lord's appearance to them, that they had actually seen him, Thomas was incredulous. He rejected it all as rubbish. Seeing for him was not enough. He demanded incontrovertible evidence. Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, that's a gruesome demand. Extreme. Putting his hand in the wound. But it was intended to express his obstinate skepticism. There was no way he could or would believe that the dead rise. Thomas was a, a very modern man, a, a, a naturalist, a materialist uh, at heart. And so he has come down to us as doubting Thomas. Oh, you can sympathize with him. Can't you? I can. Because the dead don't rise normally, naturally. This wasn't an age in which strange things like that happened and, and, and people believed in those kind of things. It, the first century was a very skeptical age. Just like we are today. They didn't see those things happening. They didn't expect those kind of things to happen, and so he's incredulous. He doesn't believe. And, and the Scriptures give some support to that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. But this wasn't normal. This wasn't natural. That's really the very point this was a supernatural event to, to, to confound human reason and rationale. This was the greatest event of history. A man rose from the dead. And it was a fulfillment of prophecy that vindicated all that Christ said about his person and work. On numerous occasions, the Lord told the disciples that he would be put to death and rise from the dead on the third day. Thomas heard all of those prophecies. He had witnessed the Lord's many miracles, which included raising the dead. Now this is different from that. This is a resurrection to a glorified body. Raising the dead is not a resurrection. But he'd seen the miracle. He'd seen Christ bring people back from the dead. The, the son of the widow of Nain and Lazarus. Jesus is the Son of God. How could death hold him? It could not. So Thomas was without excuse. And eight days later, the Lord dashed his doubts when he again came to the disciples who were gathered once again in a room behind closed doors. He came in the same way. He simply appeared in their midst and said... Peace be with you. This is the third time that he gave that greeting. 
But, but it was not vain repetition. It was to show that the Lord is full of peace and He has an abundance of it to give to His followers. At least that's Matthew Henry's explanation for this third uh, statement of, about peace. But it was also necessary, a necessary greeting for the sake of Thomas, whose expression of, uh, his expressions of doubt were, were really angry statements of unbelief. He defied God in what he was saying. You can almost hear the anger in his voice from those words. So, so what did Christ do? Revile him for his slowness? And lack of faith? Denounce him for, for testing him and, and trying his patience? No, he, he came to his fallen disciple without the scolding tone often heard in preachers. Again, he came like that gentle wind at Horeb. He came with mercy and healing, speaking peace. All for Thomas's benefit. We sometimes sing the hymn of the medieval theologian Bernard of Clairvaux, Jesus, the very thought of thee. It has the line, O hope of every contrite heart, O joy of all the meek, to those who fall, how kind thou art, how good to those who seek. He is kind to us when we fall. He patiently attends to our weakness and our doubts to, to strengthen our faith. He came to Thomas to strengthen him. Then he invited him to apply his test to, to use the, the scientific method on him. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. We're not told whether or not he actually touched the marks in the Lord's hand and side. He didn't need to. He saw the irrefutable evidence before him, and he heard the Lord's command to believe. And he did. All doubts were removed. And Thomas gave expression to perhaps the greatest confession of faith in the Bible when he said, my Lord and my God. Lord sometimes has the lesser meaning of sir. We saw that back in, in chapter 4, verses 11 and 49, the woman at the well. But here it must be given the full meaning of master of Yahweh, Jehovah, God's name in the Old Testament. Jesus had been addressed as Lord before, but never as God. But here, for the first time, Thomas addressed him in that way, ascribing full deity to Christ. Thomas realized that he is God because only God could conquer death as Christ had. And so he, he made this confession similar to Peter's in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, when he said of Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he is. But Thomas declared him to be Lord and God. In fact, in, in the Greek text, it is even stronger. It's difficult to translate it literally, but literally he states that Christ is the Lord and the God. In other words, my the Lord and my the God. Both words have the definite article. It is the, the, the clear confirmation of John's opening statement of the gospel in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so with Thomas's confession, it's as though we come full circle. The Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
is distinct from the Father in person, but one with the Father in essence, and equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit in power and glory, the triune God. And Thomas made a great confession and a very personal confession of faith. Notice he said, my Lord and my God, expressing his personal trust in Christ as his God and Savior. That's an example of saving faith, of knowledge, assent, and trust. He not only gave intellectual assent to the Lord's resurrection, he appropriated that truth. He believed in it. And the change in Thomas was immediate and complete. From being the most skeptical, the most unbelieving of the eleven, he, became, he, he came to believe more than any of them had, had confessed, at least, in their confession. He confessed Jesus to be God. And Jesus accepted it. Would he have done that if it were not true? If he were just a man or an angel or, or something less than God, would he have accepted this confession of faith? When Paul and Barnabas were in Lystra on their first missionary journey and the people proclaimed them gods, they tore their clothes and they denied it. They said, we are also men of the same nature as you. But Jesus didn't do that. He accepted Thomas's worship without hesitation because it is true. In fact, in verse 29, he promised a blessing on those who believe as Thomas did with perhaps a gentle rebuke of Thomas. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Believe what? Believe that he is the Lord and the God, the very, very God of very God, very man of very man or very man of woman, sent by God, born of a woman under the law, the Son of God, the God-man. That's who we confess. That's who Christ is. The God-man and the Savior of all who trust in Him. And down through the ages, multitudes have believed in just that way. Not with their eyes, but with their minds. By hearing or by reading the witness of these men in the Scriptures. N not with some gratuitous leap of faith. That's not Christian faith. Christian faith is not, as Bertrand Russell defined it, a firm belief in something for which there is no evidence. Genuine faith is reasonable. It is grounded on sound, solid evidence and reliable testimony. And numerous skeptics like Thomas have become believers upon studying the facts. One well-known example, probably well-known to many or most of you, is Frank Morrison, a, a British lawyer who set out to write a book refuting the resurrection of Christ. He wrote a book, but not that one. In his research, he was so overwhelmed by the evidence that he became a believer. And he wrote the book, Who Moved the Stone? Which brings forth evidence supporting the resurrection. There is sound evidence for the resurrection. But a person doesn't need to be a, a trained theologian or lawyer with access to all of the evidence in order to believe in the resurrection. The witness of Scripture is God's testimony, the revelation of God Almighty. It has about it the ring of truth. The scriptures are self-authenticating so that faith doesn't depend on external evidence. Our faith is a completely reasonable faith 
but it is also and fundamentally a supernatural faith. We don't reason our way to the truth. We are born again and understand the truth. The truth of God's Word is, understand, is understood by those who have been given spiritual eyes to see. God opens our eyes to the truth so that, that we, as we read the facts of Scripture, we perceive them with, with assurance and the Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that what we read, what we study, the gospel is true. He confirms it in our heart. It's supernatural. The Christ of the Bible is the Christ of history. And He comes to us in the Scriptures with all of the reality and all of the conviction that He came to Thomas and the other disciples in His physical appearance. The Apostle John wrote the record of his life, death, and resurrection in this fourth gospel in order to present the truth to us so that we would believe it and be saved. That's what he wrote here at the end of verse, uh, the chapter in verses 30 and 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. There's the gospel. That's the good news. Through faith in Christ, we have peace with God. We have the peace of God. We have life in His name by His person and His work. Christ is alive. We have a living Savior. And so He can be the life giver who reveals Himself to us and brings us to faith in Him. And He is still doing signs today. Not the signs that we read of in this gospel. He's not changing water to wine. He's not raising the dead. But he is changing lives. He's deliver, he delivers from deadly habits and raises up dead marriages. That is the power of God's Word working in a changed heart and the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within a changed heart, a regenerated heart. The Holy Spirit supernaturally produces in us what Paul calls in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit. First, love. Love's a supernatural gift. How can I love that person, you may say? Well, in and of yourself, you can't. But by the power of God, you can. He changes us. He produces great works within us. Love, then joy. That's a gift of God. Then peace. Those are the first three of the fruit of the Spirit. And he lists six other virtues following that. That's what the Lord has done for us now. He has given us a life of stability. He has given us a sound mind, a life of certainty in a, a, a world of uncertainty, a life of calm in a world of chaos, a world at war. That's what we should have. That's what we can have in Christ and by His grace. We have that in this as I said, world at war. But He will change all of that. Someday, He will bring peace to this planet as only He can. He's coming again. And then men will hammer their swords into plowshares and never again learn war. That's the kingdom to come. As we were reminded in Sunday school today, that's what we're to be praying for. Thy kingdom come. It's our hope, the hope of all who have put their trust in Christ and know Him as their Lord and their Savior. Have you done that? If not, Christ invites you to come to Him, to believe in Him as the Son of God 
who died for sinners and through faith and faith alone receive forgiveness and everlasting life, a life of peace. So if you've not believed, may God help you to do that. Come to Him. And, and all of us who have, may God increase love and joy and peace in our lives. And may we go out with that and serve Him. And give the gospel to a lost world. Well, let's stand and sing in the songs of praise book number 27. Number 27, Pensive, Doubting, Fearful Heart. Well, Father, we know what the God of love can do. It's miraculous things. Give life to those who are dead in their transgressions and sins. Give faith to unbelieving hearts. It's not something that we produce in ourselves, Lord. You, you do it all, and, and you're rebuilding the lives that sin has wrecked. And you will someday complete that work, and we'll be glorified, and we'll be with you in a new world. That's our hope, and it's a certain hope. So we give you the praise, and we give you the thanks. We are debtors to mercy alone. And you are full of mercy and full of peace, which you give to us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for him and for all that he's done for us. Thank you for what the triune God has done. Choosing us from eternity past, coming to redeem us at Calvary, and then the Spirit drawing us miraculously, powerfully, to a saving knowledge of, of the Savior. We thank you for that. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.